this year I found myself more engaged and challenged by this season of epiphany. Over a period of five weeks, we're presented with a variety of very graphic scenes illustrating different episodes in the way that God, the man Jesus, the word made flesh, was revealed to this world. We travel from Bethlehem, where the wise men conclude a journey of many miles to worship a child who they acknowledged to King Herod was king of the Jews. The scene then moves to the Jordan Valley where Jesus is baptized by John and God speaks from heaven declaring, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. After this, Jesus spends some time in the wilderness preparing for what lies ahead. And then we catch up with him last week when he's at a wedding in Cana where he performed his first miracle. And now in our reading today from Luke, we learn that Jesus has returned to his hometown where he grew up, passing from childhood through those difficult teenage years, perhaps, and eventually working in the family business. So imagine with me We're in a small, dusty village in the hill country of Galilee. It's Saturday morning. It's just like any other Saturday morning. And Jesus, probably with his mum and dad and his family, his brothers, hurry over their breakfast. Maybe they're a little late. And then they walk quickly to the synagogue, just as they always did, every Saturday. It's just the normal Saturday morning. And as the men enter, sitting down on one side and the women on the other, or maybe in the balcony with the children, a murmur goes round the hall. This young man, who has has grown up with them all, has come home. His reputation has come before him, and they've heard he's been teaching in various synagogues. They've probably also heard he performed healing miracles in Capernaum, and another where water was turned into wine. News travels fast in a rural community. And then at some point during the meeting, Jesus stands up, and a scroll containing a portion of the prophecy of Isaiah is handed to him. Now, I've always assumed, quite incorrectly, that he had chosen the scroll. But no, it was this particular scroll on this particular Saturday that was handed to him. He unrolled it and found the place, which we refer to as Isaiah 62. And then he read, The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolls up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were pinpointed on him. You could have heard a pin drop. And then he said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This was his mission statement. His aims and objectives and his values all rolled into one. His mission to preach good news, to proclaim freedom, and to release people. That was the reason Jesus, God incarnate, had come to earth. And he had just three years to fulfill this mission. Three years to fulfill his calling as the savior 
of the whole world. How many people do you think Jesus met during those three years? Maybe even those that had heard about him. 5,000? 50,000? I think it's unlikely that it would have been more than the population of Guildford. But from a remarkably small base, from a country under foreign occupation and military control, he had three years to fulfill a worldwide ministry. So what was God's plan? Well, later, Simon Peter acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded to him, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, or the realm of the dead, will not overcome it. Jesus' mission was to see the kingdom of God established on earth. We say this every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come as it is on earth. To achieve this, his plan was to build his church. Now, Jesus' time was finite. And he promised his disciples that they would receive a comforter who would come and live with them, live in them. And it's because his Holy Spirit lives in all who believe in him that Paul was able to say to that small church in Corinth, you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of that body. Well, it would have been a motley crowd, people probably Jews and Greeks. You see, Corinth was a busy port. There would have been merchants, probably very rich merchants. There may even have been ship owners in that congregation. But they were the body of Christ. And what Paul was able to say to them applies to us today also. As believers in Christ, we also are a part of Christ's body. Just reflect on that for a minute. We are a part of Christ's body. I find that exciting. I find that empowering. But I also find it very challenging. Wherever I go, whatever I'm doing, I'm a part of his body. I'm a part of his plan to build the church, to establish his kingdom rule on earth. Each one of us is a part of that body. I've asked four people who are representative of many others among us to come up, if the four of you could come up. They each have their own individual gifts, but through acts of service and through just being themselves, they offer themselves to the church as part of the body of Christ. There are individuals in their own right, but each of them use their various gifts for the common good of the community. They each play their part. Now I asked Zoe to represent the young people and the children in the church. Joseph, her son, is now the audiovisual technician for the music group. But all of them, all of the children, the young people, whatever large or small role they play are a part of Christ's body. Andy has fairly recently joined the team of eight in the preaching team and represents that group. Trish, she represents all the people in the church who organize meetings or the intercessions or the prayers or the coffee team and many other activities. And finally, I asked Rob to represent the finance group, such an important team in any church or organization. There are many others I could have asked in a representative capacity. But now I, may I now read again a part of the passage 
from Corinthians. You are a part of the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of his body. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it will not for that reason stop being a part of the body. Indeed, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you has a part of it. Thank you. Okay. So we're each called to actively join in God's plan to be his body on earth, where we weep, where we work, where we meet others socially, when we're at home. We all need to live in the realization of this great privilege, but one that also brings with it a challenge and responsibility. Jesus' mission was to establish the kingdom of God and to achieve this through building his church. We are all called to be involved in this mission What might God be calling you to? What part of his body is each of us playing?